The issue of transgenderism is a very hot topic in our culture today. How we as Christians respond is very important. According to GLAD, which is a big LGBT lobby, and I wanted to use their definition of transgenderism, transgenderism is a term used to describe people whose gender identity off differs from the sex the doctor marked on their birth certificates. Gender identity is a person's internal, personal sense of being a man or a woman or someone outside of that gender binary. For transgender people, the sex they were assigned at birth and their own internal gender identity do not match. Transgenderism, transgenderism or the, the medical term gender dysphoria has impacts on our community and our people. According to the findings of the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, the suicide rate within the transgender community is above 40%. The national average for suicide attempts is 4.6%. They're eight times higher, eight times more likely to commit suicide. But do we simply acquiesce to modern trends like transgenderism, or do we seek to understand the truth about this issue? According to a major report published in the fall by the New Atlantis Journal of Technology and Society, former chief of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Uni Hospital and distinguished service professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Paul McHugh, an Arizona State University professor of statistics and biostatistics, Lawrence Mayer, explore this issue of transgenderism in depth. They state that the hypothesis that gender identity is an innate, fixed property of human beings that is independent of biological sex, that a person might be a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body is not supported by scientific evidence. Compared to the general population, adults who have undergone, so these are people that have already gone through the sex assignment re surgery, continue to have a higher risk of experiencing poor mental health outcomes one study found that compared to control sex reassigned individuals were about five times more likely to attempt suicide and about 19 times more likely to die by suicide. Children are a special case when addressing transgender issues. Only a minority of children who experience cross-gender identification, so while they're young, they, they have cross-gender identification, will continue to do so into adolescence or adulthood. Only a minority will. There is little scientific evidence, and I'm reading right from the report, there is little scientific evidence for the therapeutic value of interventions that delay puberty or modify the secondary sex characteristics of adolescents, although some children may have improved psychological well-being if they are encouraged and supported in their cross-gender identification. There is no evidence, no evidence, that all children who express gender atypical thoughts or behavior should be encouraged to become transgender. There are lives at stake in this discussion. Studies like the one I just mentioned make it clear that transgenderism is not supported by scientific research. So what are we to do? How do we help and serve our fellow human beings who are engaged in this issue? <clears throat> As evangelicals, we look towards the Bible for answers. As we've dealt through the entire sexual revolution, our response is that your identity is not found in your sexuality or your gender identity. It is found in Christ. We were made by Christ, and we were made male and female by Christ. In my research, I came across two statements from Focus on the Family that we would embrace here. The modern transgender movement is systematically working to dismantle the reality of two sexes, male and female, as the Bible and the world have always known this to be. It is the transgender lobby, if the transgender lobby succeeds, there will be striking consequences for individuals, marriage, family, and society at large. While God's intent for sexuality and gender is being turned upside down, we must remember that those who struggle with their gender identity have lived lives of great pain, confusion, and rejection. And we, and just as Jesus went out of his way to reach the outcasts of society, we are called to humbly share his love embodied in the gospel to lift them up in prayer and to allow the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction, healing, and transformation. Tonight, Professor Michael Plato is going to help us understand the transgender movement in light of a larger post-human movement that's taking place on campuses uh, around our country. 
Michael Plato is an assistant professor of intellectual history and Christian thought in the School of Theology at Colorado Christian University. He received his BA in philosophy from Trinity College at the University of Toronto. His MA in popular culture from Brock University and his MTS in historical theology from Toronto Baptist Seminary. He is currently a PhD candidate in intellectual history and historical thought at the Free University of Amsterdam. He is an instructor at Ryerson University, Humber College, and Seneca College. He's a guest lecturer at the University of Toronto, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Tyndale University College. He is the review editor of Contemporary Religion and Culture at booksataglance.com, and a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, the American Society of Church History, <coughs> the Society for U.S. Intellectual History, the Popular Culture Association of Canada, and the Senior Common Room, Trinity College at the University of Toronto. He is Canadian, <laughs> from Toronto, I believe. And did you hear why all the fugitives fled to Canada? Did you hear that? Nowhere else, Toronto. <laughs> Good, that one. How you feel about that, Dr. Plato? Good one? You can use that. You know, in my research about you and about Canada, I came across how they actually came upon the name of Canada. Do you know how they named it Canada? Well, <laughs> so there was a lot of warring factions, and there was a lot of debate. And they, you know, some people wanted to name it this, other people wanted to name that. And so they finally said, all right, let's just get a hat. We'll put a bunch of letters into it, and we'll let one person draw the, the, the letters out, and then we'll name it whatever he draws out. So he goes over to the hat, and he reaches in, he picks up. C, he goes C, A, then N, A, and then D, A, and that's how Canada got its name. Well, without further ado, our friend from the north and colleague here at Colorado Christian University, Professor Michael Plato. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> Such a moving introduction. Um, I haven't, yeah. Uh, it is a little, little shocking, you know, as an academic, you're not used to, you know, the idea that people find what um, you have to say is interesting. Uh, maybe you'll feel that way at the end of this, too. Uh, um, as uh, Jeff was saying, um, he gave a very eloquent talk on, on the issue of transgenderism. In many ways, uh, this talk is what's, shall we say, going to come next. Uh, that's sort of really what, uh, that's sort of a good setup for where we are culturally. But I think um, what I'm going to be doing is a little um, uh, sort of taking us beyond uh, that. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour uh, through what's going on in terms of academia, in terms of science and technology, and even in terms of art and media we're going to be going through. And in fitting with uh, the modern contemporary culture we live in, there will be lots of visual imagery. Uh, so you don't have to keep looking at me. Uh, the pictures will be changing throughout the course of the event to sort of help guide you along. Briefly, here are three, four stories that I've taken, um, I'm taking from the news from the last couple of weeks. The Boy Scouts of America announced that it will allow transgender children who identify as boys to enroll, enroll in its boys only program. This has been enthusiastically endorsed by the New York Times, which they applaud as re uh, recognizing transgender boys for what they genuinely are, boys. The second story is out of Canada. According to the Toronto Star, the Canadian government has just settled a human rights case that could eventually pave the way for gender markers to be removed from passports, birth certificates, and other government identity documents. The assessment was that, if there, that there was no legitimate purpose or need for the government to collect sex or gender information from its citizens. The government is also making moves to remove gender-related questions from all government surveys, questionnaires, and forms. A third story, at the end of January, biologists in California announced that they, they were able, for the first time, to grow human stem cells in pig embryos. This development has led to the very real possibility of chimeras. Chimeras were ancient mythical beasts that were composites of various animals. Modern gene editing has now made it, uh, this myth a very real possibility. And it is a possibility which could affect humans. As the New York Times remarked on the announcement, 
Creating chimeras, especially those with human cells, may prove controversial, given the possibility that test animals could be humanized in undesirable ways. One would be if human cells should be incorporated into the pig's brain, endowing it with human qualities. Almost no one wants a talking pig. Another untoward outcome would be if human cells should come to, uh, to comp uh, be composed in the pig's reproductive tissues. The possibility could exist where we will have a male pig with human sperm impregnating a sow with human eggs. And in a few years, we could have the situation of human persons born of an entirely different species. Finally, at the end of last week, in Pike County, Mississippi, High school students were granted permission through a trial program to use their cell phones in all of their classes. Instead of having teachers to forbid their use, teachers have been encouraged not only to let students use their cell phones as they see fit, but also to attempt to incorporate cell phones into their lesson plans. I was looking up there to realize it was a very old timey picture I found there, you know, with the, with the flip phones. It's like, oh wow, already right out here. So why have I mentioned these particular stories? What is it that brings them all together? A few years ago, the then Pope Benedict XVI gave his annual Christmas address to the Roman Curia. In many ways, it was a standard address of its kind. The Pope thanked a bunch of people, recapped major events of the year, talked about new approaches in evangelism, and basically wished everybody a Merry Christmas. Yet within his very conventional seasonal greeting, he managed to drop a bomb. He noted, with regard, with, uh, while up to now we regard false, a false understanding of the nature of human freedom as one cause of the crisis of the family, it is now becoming clear that the very notion of being, of what being human really means, is being called into question. Briefly, in his Christmas message, he laid out what he called the anthropological revolution, where people dispute the idea that they have a nature, given by their bodily identity that serves as the, a defining element of the human being. He noted that many of today's leading thinkers had rejected the notion that it was God who made humans, male and female. It had always been society that had done so, they alleged. And now, in our liberated age, it was up to the individual to make that decision for him or herself. Within this, Benedict spotted one of the great ironies of our contemporary culture. He wrote, the manipulation of nature, which we deplore today, where our environment is concerned, now becomes man's fundamental choice where he himself is concerned. Think about that for a moment. From now on, there is only the abstract human being who chooses for himself what his nature is to be. For many of us, the changes that we have witnessed in American society over the past few years may be cause for a sense of whiplash. No sooner had the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage than a host of other identity rights issues came to the fore, most notably transgenderism, or the idea that one's gender is separate from one's genital sex. This idea has led to a host of hot-button issues, such as the use of public restrooms, proper pronoun use, military and athletics admissions, and the two of the issues that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Boy Scouts admissions and gender identity on government documents. But along with these very public and social cultural changes, there have been a number of seemingly unrelated, even innocuous transformations that have gone on, on under the surface, as it were. Not only are we hearing more and more cases, such as the genetic editing of human, pig and, uh, human and pig together that I just mentioned, but technology is seeping into our daily lives at an increasing rate as well. Cell phones, which I've just mentioned, are becoming so much part of our lives, and indeed our bodies, that they have been, can be virtually described as what Donna Haraway has called a companion species, which is shifting the boundaries of what it means to be a human. I ask you, genuinely, is it possible to not have a cell phone and be considered a valid person? <laughs> Looking out at the people who've got cell phones in their hands, yes. Uh, can you be a human without a cell phone anymore? My contention here tonight, and this is reflected in Pope ben well, what Pen Pope Benedict has said, is that these recent developments are not the end of some sort of sequence, but are in fact merely symptomatic um, and a prelude of, bi of bigger things to come. Some aspects of this movement decidedly do have their source in our popular culture of hyper-individualism, uh, where we are told that we can be who and whatever we want to be. 
Other aspects have a more religious inflection, deriving from new religions, which envision the human not as the image of God set above creation, but as merely a small drop in a larger pool of cosmic consciousness. However, I would assert that the main impetus for what um, uh, is to come in terms of this redefinition of the human, this move beyond the human, indeed this post-humanism, is largely academic and philosophical in origin. Like many of the most successfully transformative social and cultural movements of recent decades, such as feminism and transgender rights, the intellectual impetus has come from the humanities departments of many of our universities. So this is really a report from the frontline trenches, um, if you like military metaphors. Uh, that's what we're basically looking at. Now, due to the depth and the, com uh, uh, the complexity and the breadth of the subject, I have decided uh, to limit myself to delivering an exploratory and a definitional talk. I am simply going to convey what has gone on, what is going on, and what is likely to go on in the immediate future. How exactly we may begin to address and confront uh, uh, and engage these challenges, whether legally, socially, culturally, uh, religiously, or even uh, academically, I will leave for you uh, to consider. My goal is just to simply uh, spare you further whiplash. As I said, my central topic for consideration is what has been generally called post-humanism. Post-humanism, while unfamiliar to most people, is in fact one of the most rapidly expanding fields of study in the academy. Within the last three years, there have been an explosion of international conferences, symposia, articles, and books dedicated to the topic. While its emergence has been sudden, it was built on a number of important philosophical developments that have been taking place since the end of World War II. In large part, we can say that this movement is a response to even a rejection of that much larger and longer, I would say centuries longer, Western project known as humanism. In the beginning, according to humanism, was man. <laughs> that at least is the narrative that we have been presented through the secular uh, hi historical movement. No better image captures this sense of man, the measure of all things, than Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man of 1492. This classical view of perfection was to set the standard for our civilization and became Europe's self-idealized image. Linked to this visual conception are the humanistic ideals of the rational, of freedom, of self-awareness and self-determination. These were the creature features, as it were, which distinguished man from all other forms of life and placed him at the top of the food chain. Importantly, the assumptions embedded in this ideal were said to be universal, and as such were not only inclusive, but also exclusive as well. This, at least, was the critique uh, articulated when the ideal began to be taken to task in the 1960s and 70s, first by feminist critics. Essentially, these critics were asking when looking at this picture, uh, is this what I'm supposed to look like too? The feminist, Luce Eregeri, pointed out that the allegedly abstract concept of man was not only very much male, but also white, European, handsome, able-bodied, and young. What exactly did this idea share with the statistical average of humanity? This was her concern. Irigeri and others noted that if this model was to be regarded as universal, then the female, for example, could only be seen as particular, and therefore other. Other was to be different, and different was to be worth less. Being worth less, one was also therefore exploitable and disposable. Later post-colonial critics were to make the same argument with regard to race and ethnicity. One must concede that these critics of humanism, a humanism which had its origins within the secularism of the Renaissance, it might be added, um, do have a point. Jean-Paul Sartre, for instance, noted the connection between humanism, uh, specifically its notions of rationality or reason, and violence. Reason is not exclusive from violence, far from it. The Canadian scholar John Ralston Saul, in his book Voltaire's Bastards, The Dictatorship of Reason in the West, demonstrated how humanistic or enlightenment rationality apologized for violence as well as implemented it. We can, for example, see this most clearly in the horrors that were accomplished in the name of, social, um, in the name of reason and social engineering of the slave trade at Auschwitz during World War II and in the gulags of Soviet-era Russia. This critique of humanism grew and eventually became known as the 
anti-humanist movement. Makes sense. Beginning first with the feminist and post-colonialist, it was later picked up by gender theorists and others. Anti-humanists did not entirely reject all humanist values. For instance, most of them favored the human con humanistic concept of freedom. But they did strongly resist humanism's normalizing conventions, which they saw as discriminatory. These thinkers were, of course, not operating in a vacuum. The groundwork for this rejection of humanism was first laid down by the German uh, philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century, when he sought to subvert the rationalist idea of knowledge uh, that there was an underlying order to the universe. Nietzsche was important because he was the first to refute the rationalists and open up the possibility for alternative styles of thinking. Most famously, Nietzsche's proposal was embodied in his concept of the Übermensch, or Overman, or Superman, which, was set, uh, which set for humanity the goal of transcending itself. Later, the French theorist Michel Foucault uh, would build on this and Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God, and himself proclaim the death of man. Foucault insisted that man is only a recent invention, and one perhaps nearing its end. What, of course, he was talking about was humanism. Humanism, as Foucault saw it, was everything in Western civilization that restricts the desire for power. As the Cambridge historian John Coffey noted regarding Foucault, this is a bit of a lengthy quote, but he, he does certainly have a very important point. He says, Foucault made it clear that he endorsed Nietzsche's view of, on self-creation. Sartre and the California New Agers had gone awry, he suggested, because they had introduced the notion of authenticity, implying that one had to be faithful to one's true self. In fact, there was nothing within or without to which one had to be true. There's nothing within oneself that had to be, one had to be true. Self-creation has no such limits. It was about aesthetics, not morals. One's only, uh, one's only concern should be to fashion a self that was a work of art. Humanity, in fact, had no essence to it, and neither did the person. There was nothing quintessentially human or deep within ourselves that we had to uncover. We were what we made of ourselves. Posthumanism is that moment which marks the end of the conflict between humanism and anti-humanism, and the beginning of a quest to find a replacement. The posthumanist perspective rests on the assumption of the decline of humanism and the end of the European Enlightenment, but rejects the despair of modernity and instead looks to alternative possibilities. In this sense, it sees itself as largely optimistic. Grounding itself in the liberation movements of the last century, such as the civil rights movement and the, uh, the women's rights movements, developments in science and technology, as well as Foucault's project of self-creation, it builds on the anti-humanist legacy towards a new vision of what humanity could be. A significant move in this direction was the publication of Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto in 1985. For Haraway, cyborg, uh, the cyborg, a creation of science fiction, is an in-between creature between the human and the machine uh, that is neither human nor machine, but both also a human and a machine. For Haraway, the cyborg was a model on which boundary breaking could occur. Not only did she see this affecting the boundaries between male and female, uh, which we have seen happening in transgenderism already, but we also see it happening between human and non-human, human, organism and machine, the physical and the non-physical, and even between technology and the self. For Haraway and others to, ever, uh, to entertain such possibility required a seismic, sh a seismic shift in the nature of reality. And that shift began to happen in French thought in the 1960s. A number of students of Louis Althusser in Paris started reading the Dutch philosopher uh, Baruch de Sp uh, Spinoza and his idea of monism in their quest to find an alternative to Marxism, which they had already declared dead. Instead of Marxism, they preferred monism. So what is monism? Monism means that the universe is made up of one thing and one thing alone, matter. Matter, which is intelligent and self-organizing. In a monistic universe, according to Spinoza, matter, the world, and humans are not dualistic. 
Spinoza was reacting against Descartes' mind-body division and said that the mind and body were the same thing. And as there was no difference between the mind and body, there was likewise no difference between the person and the world, and the world and God. We are all one. In religious language, monism, monism has been described as pantheism, or the belief that we, the universe, and God are all the same thing. Most of the neo-Spinozists, however, have dropped the reference to God and advocate an essentially atheistic monism. Monism becomes the foundation for a post-humanism because it avoids the human-centeredness of humanism by its emphasis on the unity of all matter in the universe. We are all one with the cosmos, so what's so special about us? A significant update of Spinoza's concept, which is central to post-humanism, involves the scientific understanding of the self-organizing or smart structure of living matter. The Australian post-humanist, Rosie Bredati, calls this the embodiment of the mind and the embrainment of the body. What we call life is simply smart matter. And perhaps non-life can be smart matter as well. Other thinkers outside of the humanities have picked up on this idea of all matter having mental processes. Called panpsychism, by David uh, Skirbina, it has been described as the view that all things um, have a mind or a mind-like quality. Mind is seen as fundamental to the nature of existence and being. In opposition to idealism and Cartesian dualism, panpsychism argues that the mind is not ethereal or something that exists apart from the material world. As mathematician and novelist Rudy Rucker puts it, Mind or sentience is, he says, a universally distributed quality, and each object has a mind. Stars, hills, chairs, rocks, scraps of paper, flakes of skin, molecules, each of them possesses the same inner glow as a human. Each of them has a singular inner experience and sensation. This Vital, what end up being, this is end up being called vital materialism. And it is an idea that is picked up by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. And they argue that we can overcome the old human by in some way merging with other aspects of the world. Bradotti has labeled three of these processes, uh, becoming animal, uh, becoming earth, and becoming machine. They involve displacing the old humanity through solidarity with other species and the push for animals to attain human or near human rights. As we are beginning to see, post-humanism starts to take on an entirely new hue. Not merely is it post-European humanism, but of the human itself in terms of species. One begins to grasp the implications of this kind of thinking, uh, that this kind of thinking encourages, when one considers uh, that one of the legal goals of many uh, post-humanists is the shift from human rights to what they call existential rights. It doesn't matter if you have a human body, or a machine body, or an animal body, or a combination of the above. What matters is that you exist. That's it. That is your foundation for rights. So this is one of the legal projections of post-humanism, is the shift from human rights to existentialist rights. And we're beginning to see this already happening in the real world. Uh, here is, uh, uh, we're looking at some examples. Here we're looking at uh, Kevin uh, Warwick, um, uh, to the left here, uh, who is described as, has been described as the first human cyborg. Warwick has actually implanted microchips into his nervous system so that he is beginning to merge himself with computer technology. In the middle is the artist Orlan, uh, a woman who uses plastic surgery in order to turn herself into a work of art. So she literally goes through plastic surgery processes and then she becomes the work of art that is used in her um, artistic installations. And to the right, we have the case of Stalking Cat, uh, Stalking Cat died just a few years ago, but he is a man who went through a series of plastic surgeries in order to turn himself into a tiger. Not only a tiger, but also he explicitly wanted to be a female tiger. He's in fact the first transgender, trans species person. 
So this is sort of the implication of what we see happening out of this monistic view. Moving beyond the question of what defines the human within the context of the human, we are now looking at an entirely new category, namely species awareness. Species thinking has never been a subject for the humanities before, but we are now seeing animal studies becoming one of the hottest fields in humanities. Kind of an interesting thing. You go into humanities to study animals. Um, some people, uh, uh, you know, now is it possible to study, you know, animals in the humanities? Well, some people seem to think so. For many anti-human, uh, excuse me, for many anti-humanists, the idea that we can run with the, the animals is an exhilarating idea. Yep, this is not just all, you know, academic talk. Business and science are already there in terming, terms of bringing humans and animals together, certainly at the level of biogenetics and what is called cognitive capitalism. Melinda Cooper has noted in her book, Life as Surplus, the real capital for advanced capitalism is life. Life in the sense of information code, of, uh, the information code of all that lives. At the beginning of 2017, advances such as the Human Genome Project are regarded as ancient history. We already control the genetic code for our own species as well as that of multiple others. Dolly the sheep, the first animal to be cloned, was done so using technology which by today's standard is reg regarded as antique and obsolete. And now, of course, we have the potentiality of producing human offspring, uh, offspring via pig parents. As Rosie Bradotti notes, and she chooses her words very uh, carefully here, she says, we are witnessing the end of biblical reproduction. You need a mom and a dad to make a baby, that's biblical reproduction. We are seeing the end of that. Well, that probably the, no, for me, maybe the, the term to remember the most, uh, the end of biblical reproduction. This assessment is not entirely new, of course. Now, how many technologically assisted reproductions have we had since the first in vitro fertilization in 1978? It is also uh, um, the end of the, a very naive 20th century idea of the exploitation of nature by man. We are no longer exploiting nature in any simple sense. We are remaking it. Universities are now actually making life through biogenetics, nanotechnology, and information technology. In our agriculture, there is virtually nothing which has not been interfered with and modified in some way in terms of genetic enhancement. The first synthetic meat was developed four years ago at the University of Delft. And a couple, just two months ago, as a matter of fact, an American company called Memphis Meats produced the first artificial meatball. Uh, meat call, meatball costs eighteen thousand dollars, by the way, um, and they are confident uh, that artificial meat, even though this meatball was eighteen thousand bucks, they are confident within the next few years, say five years or so, artificial meat will be available in grocery stores. Um, all of these uh, um, developments, of course, are copyrighted or owned by various corporations and institutions. Now, I mean, I, I don't know why some people find it weird. Uh, artificial meat sounds weird. I mean. Haven't you ever had a Big Mac? I mean, <laughs> McDonald's isn't, isn't funding this, is it? Uh, so yeah, it's like, yeah, so artificial meat is on the way. Uh, with, I, probably within five years or more, this will be something that you'll be able to purchase uh, in your grocery store. Now, there are some limitations in place for this kind of research. For instance, a number of restrictive policies were put in place in the U.S. by the administration of George W. Bush, inhibiting a great deal of biogenetic research. I'm not sure what will occur um, with the Trump administration, but the Obama administration has largely upheld the Bush policies. Uh, so while areas uh, such as information technology continue to advance here in North America, the biotech industry um, has had to uh, blossom very much elsewhere, and bloom it has. The one place in the world which is set to dominate this new and potentially highly profitable industry is the one place where, uh, which has virtually no government restrictions, namely China. One area that we see developing 
quite quickly uh, there is the splicing of animal DNA with human. Uh, this will be seen as an especially, especially useful in terms of growing new organs for humans using animal surrogates. Um, as I have just mentioned with regards to uh, the uh, recent fusion of pig and human with, uh, with human stem cells. Another example uh, is the recent growth of a human ear out of the back of a mouse. Um, this uh, occurred in Japan. So you could grow a human ear out of a mouse and then use that to transplant onto a human. Um, ultimately, it's going to be business and not the academic eggheads that are going to begin the process of ra erasing the distinctions between species, at least in the real world. For Christians and many other religious believers, we must therefore conclude that if we are to provide an effective critique of posthumanist trends, we must also of necessity be able to provide a deep criticism of advanced capitalism as well. We cannot afford to merely storm the ivory towers of academe. If it's any consolation, most of the left-leaning and liberal posthumanists in the ivory towers are beside themselves with grief over their own complicitness with corporate interests. The overwhelming bulk of the, this kind of research into these areas is not done in corporate labs, but in university research departments. Uh, the university themselves, ever in need of new funding, have sought to capitalize this and turn themselves into for-profit research centers. Uh, certainly, as we see, for example, at the um, Anschutz Medical uh, Research Center at the University of Colorado, which does a lot of the genetic research here in, um, in the, uh, the state of Colorado. Now, this convergence of humanity with technology um, is a uh, central feature of much of human, post-humanist thought. And this brings us to, uh, alongside another, and in many ways, a competing school of thought known as transhumanism. Transhumanism is perhaps better known to most people thanks to its better marketing, and people often confuse the term with posthumanism, thinking that they are synonyms. Like posthumanism, transhumanism explores the space between the human and technology. But while posthumanists look to technology as a means of merging with the rest of the world, transhumanism sees technology as evolution, advancing the cause of the human. In a sense, transhumanism is merely humanism by other means. Transhumanism ultimately accepts the major premise, premises of humanism, that the, the individual is autonomous, reason is a key marker of, marker of personhood and identity, and the human is not enmeshed in the world. In some ways, it is an intensification of humanism, arguing that perceived limitations, such as biology, can be overcome by technological means, resulting at some point in the future in an advanced human form, with typically greater intelligence, greater longevity, and greater well-being. It can be argued that within the transhumanist movement, there is a fundamental goal of achieving immortality through technology. Perhaps even more so in, than in posthumanism, the religious ambitions of transhumanism are nakedly apparent. Transhumanist proponents regularly invoke religious language, talking of immortality, the spiritual capacities of technology, and humans becoming godlike. Zoltan Istvan, a major cheerleader for the movement and the transhumanist party candidate in the US presidential election of 2016, and I don't know why he wasn't here. I would have been in the front row with popcorn if uh, you had him speaking at uh, the Centennial Institute. Um, he is fantastic, by the way. He, like, whoa, he goes all over the place. It's, a, it's amazing. Istvan speaks enthusiastically of the day when we will all become immortal cyborgs, human brains preserved in mechanical bodies. Yeah, I like to see Trump argue that in a debate. Um, <laughs> yet, in a different kind, uh, yet it is also a different kind of spirituality from posthumanism. Much of the transhumanist project is geared toward developing technologies that could eventually lead to substituting flesh with biomechanical material, or of downloading the human mind into computers, or integrating human minds with one another via network hookup. If posthumanism is a new and sophisticated form of pantheism where all is connected and one, then transhumanism is cutting edge and technologically savvy Gnosticism, where the body is seen as disposable, repugnant, something to be overcome. 
and the mind or intellect is that which is ethereal and needs to be freed or shifted to ever pl higher planes of existence. It is not surprising that many within the movement are deliberately form, uh, forging transhumanism into a legitimate religion. Though most transhumanists still shun the word religion, which they feel must be connected to a belief in a higher being, as well as operating within the confines of oppressive dogma and institutional structures, they nevertheless are beginning to speak of it as a religion eclipsing philosophy. The World Transhumanist Association, which recently rebranded re itself as Humanity Plus, and that's their logo, describes transhumanism as, quote, a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology. Now, while that might sound a little dull, the transhumanist Dirk Brewer declares that this is, as he sees it, quote, the single most um, momentous event in a billion years. So I don't know what else has you know, happened in a billion years, that, but apparently that's, this is the most momentous thing, uh, according to him. Now, while most transhumanists come from the science and engineering fields and could largely be described as atheistic, not all of them are. Some religious groups have also attempted to jump on the bandwagon. While there are some Christian transhumanists, the movement seems to be particularly potent amongst Mormons. The Mormon Transhumanist Association, while not officially endorsed by the Latter-day Saints Church as of yet, is at least warmly encouraged by it. The MTA meets regularly just across the street from Temple Square in Salt Lake City. And speaking personally, having listened to a number of their lectures, uh, particularly online, uh, that are posted by the group, transhumanism does seem to have a rather uncanny fit with Mormon theology, particularly their concept of theosis, which is the process by which human beings become gods. Now, I have spent the past while attempting to draw a picture of where this new and emerging movement came from what essentially it is saying and attempting to show you its theoretical groundings. Yet the, despite the newness of much of this uh, terminology that I've been giving to you, many of the concepts should not be totally foreign to you. In fact, much of our media and its cultural products have been getting us ready for the post-human future for some time. Hollywood has been preparing the way for post-humanism. The sociologist Ulrich Beck once talked about the preponderance of disaster movies, about the, the destruction of humanity. Films such as Armageddon, Deep Impact, Independence Day, 2012, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, and on and on. And he noted that this trend largely manifested a latent fear that humanity may somehow be coming to an end. Some movies show more directly the transformation of the human through the union with the other. The Alien movie series starring Sigourney Weaver demonstrated this by showing the merging of the human with the alien and the monstrous. In the first two Alien movies, humans are used to birth alien creatures. The alien, the other, is inside of us. In the third film, the main character of Ripley, played by Weaver, literally becomes the mother of an alien. And in the fourth movie, Alien Resurrection, for those who you know, keep up on these things, uh, uh, Ripley is resurrected biomechanically, but with her genes completely fused with the alien creature. And we witness the birth of a human-alien hybrid, an entirely new species that takes the human and something else beyond to the next stage. And we can sort of see that's a little darker, but you can kind of see that's what uh, she's holding there, is the, this birthed creature, uh, which is part human and part alien. More pleasantly, of course, there's Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> while the pantheistic philosophy behind Star Wars uh, universe uh, and the concept of, of the Force have been discussed to the point of banality, everybody knows this about it, um, it is interesting to note the almost casual way that humans are shown to live in harmony with alien creatures and monsters, as well as cybernetic and robot beings. Both Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker have bodies that are fused with technology. Um, and, we, and that's actually a very lovely, happy picture of the future. 
where we see human and techno merged in the body, um, well, uh, uh, then there, you know, basically, but then we have also, sorry, Jurassic World from also a couple of years ago, which clearly demonstrates the link between the biotech and cognitive capitalism taken to the extreme. We will create creatures just to entertain ourselves, is what the, the movie is really kind of showing. Uh, that we'll, just, we'll create mo uh, monsters just in order uh, to make money and keep ourselves amused. Transhumanism's push for superhuman immortality seems to be one of the most consistent champs at the box office, especially in the guise of the superhero narrative. From X-Men's superior evolved group of good-looking mutants, to Batman and Iron Man's technological exoskeletons, to the virtually godlike qualities of Superman and Thor, young people and old are now being regularly fed a diet of images of humans that move above and beyond the human. Yet, perhaps the most remarkable and brilliant cinematic representation of post-humanism, I would think, is the James Cameron film Avatar, the most successful movie in human history. Again, much has been made of the pagan and pantheistic backdrop of the film, especially by Christian commentators, uh, noting the religious practices of the Na'vi creatures at the center of the story. But there's much more to it. Here we are seeing a depiction of the new humanity, digitally mediated into a post-species form. Humanity is represented as having a multi-present subjectivity, which is simultaneously virtual and biological. We live in the biological and the tech at the same time. The central character of Jake Sully, a representation of the old humanist human, he is male, white, uh, uh, represents um, imperialistic military and corporate interest, but he's also crippled, bespeaking the old European humanism, which is a crippled tradition. Via virtual technology, he is able to escape identity the identity politics of the past. People in the future will no longer be identified as white, black, or brown. They'll be blue. Um, he takes on an alien appearance, one which exhibits decidedly animalistic characteristics. And in fact, these Navi can directly link biologically with various other animal species, demonstrating the interrelatedness of all creatures and all life in a one unified planet world. A very important development in Cameron's aliens, though, is their strongly sexual and erotic characteristics. And indeed, the film suggests the character has an active sexuality in his newly embodied existence. The future is technologically enhanced trans species transsexuality. So yes, we're getting some alien love happening there. Um, what can we say in conclusion? In terms of a post-human future, there can be little real argument, for it is already here. Its manifestations have not yet been as extreme as many of its advocates could hope for, but its continued growth in popular society does seem inevitable. We could, of course, uh, we, of course, I should say, must not ignore what is good in it. For one thing, it attacks a form of secular humanism which has been dominant in the West for at least four centuries. As Christians and religious believers, we do not have much to lament in secular humanism's demise, or at least in certain aspects of it or characteristics of it. It has been responsible for some of the worst atrocities and idiocies of our civilization. And despite much of the good that it has provided, I'm glad to see it finally being put to rest. It also brings to attention just how much our lives are in fact connected to technology and other species. As a person who loves both dogs and robots, I applaud this. At the same time, the new humani post-humanity does not appear altogether the most amenable substitute. It is already meeting us, and aggressively so, with many new challenges, and may in fact prove to be more, a more worrisome opponent than humanism uh, ever was. In one of his most uh, significant and prophetic books, The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis foresees a future where, he says, mankind is to be cut out into some fresh shape at the will of some few lucky people in one lucky generation which has learned how to do it. Lewis feared the advancements he saw science producing all around him in his day, um, and he thought they would be apply, uh, their application to huma humanity would be uh, disastrous in terms of its consequences in the future. 
He modestly suggests that science must be exercised with restraint and guided by older and wiser human traditions. That many transhumanists would hear these as fighting words which uh, should be of no surprise. And we can certainly see the possibility of near future political battles over the employment of certain technologies, such as cloning, implants, and bio species, uh, sort of cross species bioengineering. Yet, what seems to have gone even beyond Lewis' predictive abilities was the redefinition of humanity out of existence altogether. But this re redefinition is perhaps, in the end, only symptomatic of a much deeper and much more abiding trouble in the West. I want to conclude with the words of Pope Benedict from his address that he delivered um, at Christmas, um, which I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. Benedict writes at the end of his speech, when the freedom to be creative becomes the freedom to create oneself, then necessarily the maker himself is denied, and ultimately man too is stripped of his dignity as a creature of God as the image of God at the core of his being. When God is denied, human dignity also disappears. Whoever defends God is defending man. Ultimately, the human question is a God question. Thank you. I don't know. Do we want to do questions? OK. Uh, that was, I know, that was a, a bit of a roller coaster. <laughs> I was covering a lot of terrain. Um, I might not be able to answer. I will see how it goes. But um, yeah, just if there's anybody has any, any questions. No. Uh, how do the post-humanists deal with the idea? They talk about the, they talk about the intelligent um, uh, the coalition of, of matter, the post-humanists. How do they yep. deal with that intelligence and where does it come from? Uh, well, they just say it, it's inherently a part of all matter. Um, what they would, uh, uh, that uh, it's just that uh, uh, what we call the human brain is just a, a place where there's sort of a, a spot where it, it's kind of condensed itself. But they would say all human thought, all in, intelligence is actually a part of all matter. It's, ju it's, ju it's just part of the, the, the nature of it. It doesn't it's not a process that has to be generative. It's just always been there right from the beginning. Uh, what we think of as mind, uh, we always, uh, again, this is Spinoza sort of um, seeing this distinct, you know, uh, pointing to what Descartes, Descartes sort of had this idea of the mind and, and the, 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 the body are this sort of separate thing. Um, and, he, and Spinoza says that's just an illusion. Everything is a part of a thinking matter. You're thinking with your body, but everything else is sort of, is sort of that same sort of thinking. That's really how they see it. And because of that, that's why everything is eventually, you know, connectable in some sort of way. If that <laughs> gives you a little bit there. Yes? Pass. From a Judeo point of view, there's a prohibition of having anything to do with pigs. Yep. So what I find interesting is that through my studies, there are certainly um, species that have more in common with the hum human genome than a pig. So then why is a pig selected? That I don't know. Uh, you would have to... Um uh, they, I mean, it was a big uh, a pig bioblast, uh, but I would not, that's, that's sort of beyond my terrain of expertise. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, the geneticists who are working on that would, uh, I mean, and it's certainly something that could be looked into. But at the moment, I would not, I mean, yeah, why a pig? It's a good question. I think, um, it, I mean, whether or not it's a pig, or, I mean, that particular is a very interesting uh, example that you do raise that. Um, but I mean, certainly within uh, the post-humanist uh, notions, it will certainly not be limited to it. I mean, because that's the eventual goal, is that there's the possibility of multiple forms of species that this could happen with. But yeah, I, that's, that's a tech science question I'm not able to answer. Yeah, sure. And what's also interesting about this is that with respect to the telomeres that control um, perhaps age, but there is a human genius that specifically turns off growth factor. So we as humans, we have a gene that, that regulates our height and our growth. So this particular creature that's created, that's been turned off. So you have giant cats. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not just humans, but all sorts of multiple species. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to the interactionism between existential rights and transhumanism, because do you think that those will be able to interact with each other um, successfully in the future? Because I think about like the mouse with the ear with existential rights. Like mm-hmm. I don't think they would make a human grow an ear for another human. Yep. So well, do you think that they can work together? No, uh, in a lot of ways. To, uh, <laughs> in fact, the transhumanists and the posthumanists are often fighting one another. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's a good, I maybe should have elucidated it. They're both, this is one of those things. I'm academic, I'm very fussy about terminology because there's a lot of posthuman trans- transhumanism often get um, sort of uh, blended together, but posthumanism has a very um, different philosophical agenda from transhumanism. Transhumanism, like I said, it's basically kind of humanism by other means. It's just sort of, we want it, we're, you know, it's, it's the idea of the old ideas of progress and, you know, evolution, and we're going to make the next step. It's really all about, you know, we'll exploit whatever to make us humans better and better. Posthumanism rejects that altogether, saying that is a, um, a, a falsity, that's a, sh- a charade, and we should be trying to get something that is unifying everything together. So, yeah, uh, for the uh, uh, posthumanists, they would not be very particularly keen on the idea, again, of you know animals being exploitable for human organs. But that's definitely a, a transhumanist. So they're, they're very much two movements. Um, that are going in different re- directions. And like I said, they're often at odds. They often clash with one another. Yeah. Also, I'd say posthumanism, just to give you an idea, you find most pu- posthumanism, posthumanists are in, within the academy, within universities. Transhumanists, like Zoltan Istvan, um, usually have their own private companies or their, uh, their own private institutions, like the Mormon Transhumanist Association. They're independent like um, institutes um, or um, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, corporations, that kind of thing. Um, Brandon first, and then, yeah. Oh. Um, so throughout the, the 20th century, oftentimes the, um, the great dictators of the world of the 20th century focused a lot on eugenics, and that was in their, in their goal to perfect humanity. In what way would you see this as connected to that? Would you see this as a extension of the eugenics movement? Uh, that's a very good point. Um, and I would be very interested, yeah, certainly to hear what somebody like Isfan would say on that. Because uh, they, would, they would say, um, well, first of all, I mean, the transhumanists would certainly uh, uh, try to uh, uh, diminish the concept of sort of a racial superiority. Um, and they tend, most transhumanists tend not to work so much through genetic means. Um, they sort of, transhumanists generally seem to go more to the merging with tech, uh, other forms of technology. So like I said, a lot, I mean, there can certainly be some genetic uh, um, aspects of it, um, but they wouldn't, it, they, it, it's not, I mean, they probably wouldn't be, you know, going directly for the same idea of eugenics. Um, though you certainly could see that the implications are clear that there is a connection. Um, but like I said, m- a lot of it would be like, how can we uh, fuse the human mind to a computer, for example? That's a very much an idea there. But that's a good point. Uh, did, you have a, did you have somebody? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, the microphone's coming up. Mine was just a clarification question. So with trying to merge the pig genome and the human, would that be more the monism or the transhumanism? And were you saying that Avatar was monistic or transhumanist? Uh, the, I would say, um, okay, uh, the, well, I mean, again, I mean, what's happening in the science is not directed by these movements, okay? The science is doing what the scientists are doing. Um, however, I mean, uh, I mean, you could say it could go either way. I mean, the one, you're merging the two together, but their goal is to provide organs. Uh, that was the, the reason for that, uh, putting the stem cells, so that they could produce human organs that could be harvested uh, for other human beings. Um, again, I wouldn't exactly say that that's directly connected to either movement. It's just simply one of the things that we're doing in biomechanical stuff nowadays, which has implications that could be taken into either uh, degree. Uh, in terms of avatar, I'm saying it's, it's much more of a post-humanist view, because transhumanists would be, you know, 
uh, you know, let's, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the, a good example, that really new, that, that terrible new Johnny Depp movie. Uh, that kid, his last one where he, he had his brain uh, transferred over to the computer system. That's definitely a transhumanist kind of concept. Avatar, the whole idea is that he's, le you know, leaving his body, but he's merging with another species. He's becoming another species. And that species links with other species and merges with the entire planet. So for me, in many ways, um, Avatar is a textbook of, of, of modern post-humanism. Yeah. So in, um, oh, I hate microphones, sorry. Yeah. Um, in The Abolition of Man, Lewis also talks about how like man's continuous um, motivation to conquer nature actually turns into nature conquering man because it gives it a bigger domain. Do you think that transgenderism and like transhumanism and stuff like that is kind of a result of instead of man conquering nature and being able to like become one with nature, it's more of nature conquering man? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think, I mean, from our perspective, we're always looking at ourselves uh, in that regard. Um, I think what we're seeing is, I mean, it's certainly an idea within humans. I can't simply say, a I mean, well, I, I don't, I don't, unless you're sort of seeing nature having, having a conscious impact on that sort of way, um, I can't really see that. I mean, I, I, I see people who, who, uh, who embrace that idea, but I don't know if nature, I mean, and, and, but then, then ultimately that's still a human project. It's a human project for nature to conquer humanity as opposed to. So that's the only way I would look at it. I can't really say, of, you know, this is nature's victory in a way. That, I mean, I still see it as this is human beings doing their own thing, is really how I sort of see it. Oh, uh, we got another one here. After all you have presented to us, obviously all these uh, movements uh, and what is projected what you have projected for the future this is anti and god created now as christians we can stand on the word of god mm -hmm. but do you have any suggestions as to what the christian world uh in in its composition of various churches and organizations how do they approach this what is their response what is our response as uh, the christian body to be that's what I'm hoping you'll come up with an answer to. Uh, that is one of the, this is so new, um, we're only just beginning to come up with an answer to that. And that's why I'm not providing any answers here. I'm just showing you the way things are and what's going on. This is now the job for the church. This is now uh, the job for our thinkers, our theologians, our pastors, our church communities to start to engage. I'm just telling you what's going on in the world and now it's time to sort of, uh, and I want to present, and I've tried to do it as fairly as possible and as generously as possible. Um, I do think the people that are presenting these ideas, I mean, they're passionate and, and convictional in their belief. Uh, I mean, I've met people like Rosie Bradotti, uh, uh, and uh, she's a wonderful woman in many ways, and, and they're very much, they have a passion for what they do, and they believe it's right. And I wanted to present that to us, but now it's, yeah, it's, it's what we've got to start to do. I think one of the problems we've had is that in the church, um, we have really lost um, uh, our anthropology. Um, from the early, the early church spent a lot of time, particularly in times of trying to understand Christ to develop a Christology, we had to understand because Christ, I think we could say, and maybe this is the starting point, Christ is ultimately the, the, um, the embodiment of what a human being should be. If we want to know what an idea of a human should be, Christ is who we look to. And that's where we're going to start, but it's up to the theologians and uh, the, uh, uh, the pastors to start uh, to work from there. Um, okay, we'll do the one over here and then. Thanks. Um, the connection to the Mormon religion, is that with the um, transhumanism, is that right. related to, because uh, I don't understand that much about what you said about the Mormon religion, yep. is like to, to reach immortality? Mormons hold um, a theological doctrine called theosis. They believe uh, that, um, and this again is very much you know, a statement by uh, you know, uh, uh, what you see in their doc documents and in their church elders, they believe that human beings uh, progress 
from a state of human uh, kind to a divine status. They hold that uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, who they see as an independent figure within the Trinity, was once a human being who became a god, and they became the god of our world. Uh, they believe that humans, through uh, a series of perfectible states, interestingly, by the way, Mormons hold that only there, there's an, only a material world. They're ultimately monistic. They don't believe in a division between spirit and matter. They believe spirit is just a purely refined form of matter. So they are utterly materialistic, and they believe humans can eventually, um, through this sort of religious process, become um, over, especially when they, they cross over into their next lifetime, uh, become deities or divine in, immortal beings who will rule their own planet. This view very much, I said, like I said, seems to fit with the transhumanist project. They have a, an entirely materialistic view of the universe, and they believe that humans can achieve a material immortality. So that's really where, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but that's really where, where I saw that coming from. Yeah. Nirvana. <laughs> Not nirvana, well, it's a material nirvana. Uh, nirvana is a, a state of non-existence in Buddhism. But uh, this is like, no, existing at, this is becoming, we are becoming as gods. Yeah. Uh, so when you were explaining, uh, you know, how post-humanism arrived, and it's a rejection of humanism, a rejection of, uh, you know, man being above, you know, supreme. Um, or I guess I'm seeing a conflict in their reasoning, and I wonder how they defend it. Because if they're trying to meld man with nature, you know, kind of create this system where everyone's connected, don't they have to modify nature as well, not just man? And doesn't that kind of put them in the position of hypocrisy, where they're also trying to conquer the world? To, to fit some uh, kind of scheme. yeah, that that's actually one of the points that, that that is a point that they do wrestle with. Yeah, uh, but that that there is a bit of conquest. But they do see what they're the way they sort of see it as is that life and uh, is something that isn't just simply uh, you know uh, something distinct uh, and that it's exists only as it is. It is always changing, and so we're a part of that. So we're emerging with that. So that would be their, they, they're not sort of seeing that nature is this other thing. Uh, that we need to uh, deal with. But you, I mean, it is, again, it is an interesting point. Like, again, Pope Benedict's, you know, comment at the beginning that most of these people still have this idea of that, you know, they still want to have some kind of pristination of nature, but then meddle where things are, with humans are concerned. So one nature is fine uh, to meddle with and the other is not. But yeah, that is, there, there is a bit of a, a, a sort of a squirming conscience there. Now, they don't see themselves as, you know, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, as, as, as brutalist and, as, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, imperialist as the, the transhumanists, but it is there. Um, should we do one more question and then, uh, yes. Do you want, oh, well, last question at the back of the room, yes. Gail. Thank you so much, Michael. Not so much a question, but maybe you could respond to this. And it's probably because I'm studying in Genesis, but I'm just sort of musing back here if, this is the 21st century version of the Tower of Babel. You know, we're, we're building this thing, and, and I, you know, who knows how the Lord is going to take care of it. And then just the verse in Corinthians that I ec echoes in my mind so much is, uh, you are not your own. You've been bought with the price. So we think we are our own. And um, anyway, I just really appreciate your... Um, presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gail. All right. We just have a few minutes here but as we wrap. I think um, for those of us, I have a philosophy degree and that was still like eating a steak dinner. Um, that was a lot of information. But I think um, what's important to remember is that um, as conservatives, we place an emphasis on the permanent things, on uh, natural law, what God has created. And out of his wisdom, he's created something good. He created the male and female. Um, both of those are wrapped up in the image of God. And um, we started today with a notion of transgenderism and moved to transhumanism. And what Professor Plato was brilliantly able to show is that this is a much larger conversation across um, our communities, that transgenderism is one aspect of that. Um, and uh, while not all 
technology is bad. I mean, it's helped us. We have the longest lifespan um, out of any generation that's ever existed. Um, it's also created to a lot of problems. Uh, for one that comes to mind is the fact that we've more or less essentially eliminated Down syndrome people um, off this planet because of our technology and our ability to identify that gene. Um, so it's done both good things and it's done uh, very terrible things. Um, and so uh, we have work to do as we understand these movements, um, but I think we go back to the role of natural law, we go back to the role of the image of God, and we try to help our communities navigate these new issues. I mean, think about it. Even five years ago, if we had done a talk on transgenderism, nobody would have shown up to it. It's not that big of a deal five years ago. Uh, now it's on the front of all of our minds and something that we deal with here at Colorado Christian University in the press as well. So um, we need to continue to think through that in light of um, this last quote that he had up there, um, the notion of the image of God, the notion of permanent things, the notion of natural law, and how God in his wisdom has created things while also recognizing that um, progress can be very good, just has to be done um, in wisdom. Um, I did want to point out, uh, we did put together this Trump-Pence policy recommendation. This was a big project at the Centennial Institute. Some of the recommendations in here include bioethic recommendations that came from Professor Plato. This is available on our website. There's 20 different issues we cover, everything from um, national defense to the Second Amendment, crime, economics, education, religious freedom, marijuana, uh, poverty and opportunity, sanctity of life, trade. All these, we provided very specific policy recommendations for the Trump-Pence administration. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, this will be a, a point of uh, interest with regards to the Trump administration. Uh, the Obama administration got rid of the uh, President's Council on Bioethics. Um, he created a separate council, but it didn't have the policy recommendations uh, like the Bush administration did. So this is all going to affect us. Um, as you know, the Obama administration opened wide doors on stem cell research, um, which Bush uh, had put restrictions on. So how that plays out in the Trump administration is something to, to be seen. But I am grateful that you all came out here. I hope that we give you some stuff to think about and reflect upon this larger movement. Um, Professor Plato, we often joke, if you come to Colorado Christian University, you get to study under Plato. So um, one of the feathers in our cap here at CCU, and he did a wonderful job tonight. So I hope you all join us uh, in just a few weeks. For Michael Weirds, we talk about the role of faith in the Obama administration. Until then, have a blessed night. Thank you so much for coming out.